I often have patients who uh, have significant anxiety and they are often afraid that if they don't do something to push the anxiety away, avoid the trigger, et cetera, they're afraid that they're going to get so overwhelmed by their emotion that they're going to have something really bad happen to them. They're afraid that they're going to die. They're, they're afraid that they're going to have a panic attack. So one of the purposes of emotion exposure is to help a person um, grow more comfortable with feeling the emotion, experiencing the emotion without necessarily running away from it, uh, avoiding it, or even maybe taking it out on, on other people. And so what, what often happens is that people going along in life, there's a trigger, they start to get distressed, anxious, angry, whatever, and then they do something to avoid the situation that's making them feel that way, which causes their uh, anxiety to come down quicker. However, it doesn't help them deal with the initial triggering event, right? So what we want to do is, again, we want to get people to uh, approach their emotions in a healthier way where they aren't always worried about, I'm going to get stuck up here and it's, um, you know, never going to get any better. order for me to help parents make the changes that are necessary for their kids, the parents themselves have to first be involved in a therapeutic relationship that's not judgmental, that's not blaming, and that understands and acknowledges and recognizes all of the things that the parents have been through. I understand that parents, by the time they come and see me, have been told what to do by numerous clinicians, by numerous therapists, by family members, by friends. They are given a lot of contradictory information. And what I know is that I have to then sort of work to gain their trust. Parents that I work with, parents whose kids have intense emotions that have led to um, very problematic and very unsafe behavior, have a tremendous amount of ongoing fear and anxiety, dread, despair. Um, They are always wondering if something's going to happen to their child. They are also worried that they are going to do something that is causing, that is going to cause their child to harm him or herself. I help parents to understand that they can, I know, and they have to know that they can do everything they can to create as much safety as they can, and they may not be able to stop unhealthy and unsafe behaviors. Consequences of behavior affect the probability that that behavior will occur again. Uh, So what happens after the client admits a certain behavior uh, is going to affect the chances that the client will do it again. So what we do in response to or following a particular client behavioral process, behavioral response, what we do in response to that is going to reinforce it, help to extinguish it, or perhaps punishment, punish it and make it less likely to occur. What we do is always going to impact the frequency of that behavior. Most clients find it pretty uncomfortable to take a deep dive into the micro steps, micro decisions, micro behaviors that lead to big problematic behavioral responses. And looking at that carefully Uh, is often aversive for clients. And yet it's a crucial part of our work. Every time the client emits a particular problematic behavior, something that is uh, impacting their life in a negative way or impacting the therapy in a negative way, every time that happens, we really need to do a behavioral analysis. And the behavioral analysis or chain analysis is sometimes called functions for many clients as a punishment it makes them less likely to do that particular behavior. And in that way, it serves our purposes. There are many forms of therapy interfering behaviors, let me say, and it's really crucial for the therapist to recognize them when they happen and to respond appropriately to them so that we make them less likely to reoccur.
over 85% of the DSM diagnoses involve emotion dysregulation in some way. And so this is why I have always emphasized the fact that DBT is helpful for so many other problems that clients might be dealing with. So the biosocial theory really, again, focuses on how the pervasive emotion dysregulation experienced both by clients with borderline personality disorder as well as other problems um, results from two main factors. So this is the DBT theory as to how emotion dysregulation develops. So first off, we have a biological predisposition to what we refer to as emotional vulnerability. The second factor here is that when we have that highly sensitive individual growing up in an environment where they're experiencing pervasive invalidation. So on an ongoing regular basis, they are experiencing um, some form of invalidation. This is when we have kind of the perfect storm. When I see these clients, there's often that sense of emptiness, that lack of sense of self, the lack of self-awareness, the clients who don't have a good sense of uh, their identity, what their values are, and so on, because they've gotten so good at pushing stuff down, basically invalidating themselves. I've actually had more than a few clients who have become quite emotionally overwhelmed when they learn about this theory. Um, because it's very empowering and because it helps to reduce the self-judgment, the self-blame and the shame that often builds um, where clients carry this around with them thinking, you know, there's something wrong with me. This is not about placing blame on anybody, but it's about helping us to understand our client and helping, um, helping our client to understand themselves. Mindfulness is a much more than a, a technique embedded in a treatment methodology or a particular tool, as people put it in their toolbox. It's much, it can be much more than that, although in those contexts, uh, mindfulness is certainly a powerful uh, element of the treatment platform. And so mindfulness practice is about trusting we have all the awareness we need, and then actually bringing, training ourselves to bring attention on purpose in a non-judging way or in an accepting and welcoming way to whatever is here and now. And this capacity to shift out of the identification with the stream of reaction and come back to simply being present here and now, staying in the moment as a lot of people like to put it now, just noticing what's here in the moment is what mindfulness empowers us. And it's really that uh, noticing of what's here now, whether it's the thoughts in our mind, the sensations of the body, our reaction to the world around us or someone else, it's the noticing of whatever that might be that gives us a chance to change our relationship and uh, no longer be caught up in a reactive pattern, but rather respond. Uh, oftentimes people uh, will will notice, wow, I felt really relaxed, or I haven't felt that peaceful all day or in a week or whatever it is. And, uh, and I like to uh, differentiate at that point. Um, we're not trying to necessarily create a deep state of relaxation. We are actually uh, cultivating awareness moment by moment, whatever might be going on. When we can make our home an awareness, even for a few moments, using our skills and our trust and our ability to be mindful, we have the chance to change our relationship to these experiences of the inner life. And that's really, in a way, what the transformative power of mindfulness is all about. There are what we call the crisis survival skills. And these are essentially the skills that clients need to help themselves get through a really difficult situation and avoid making things worse. And then there's the reality acceptance skills, which involve practicing ways of accepting reality as it is, accepting really, really difficult situations in life, pain that you might be going through, um, experiences from the past that are really difficult to deal with in the present. So learning how to kind of practice accepting things as they are. 
what can be helpful is to help clients identify what are some of the key indicators that you might be either in a crisis or kind of slipping into a crisis. Um, some of those indicators could be that your emotions feel really intense and overwhelming. Okay, so that's one thing. Um, another could be that you're having urges to do things that would actually maybe help you in the short term, but probably make things worse in the long run. So behaviors like self-injury or attempting suicide or self, um, substance use, maybe like interpersonal outbursts or aggression toward other people or those types of things. So these are all things that might help in the very, very short term, um, but probably actually make things worse in the long term and maybe even make things worse in the next 10 or 15 minutes. A radical acceptance involves the complete acceptance of reality as it is right now in the present moment. And so it's probably gonna sound like a tall order to a lot of people. You normally are not gonna be able to control yourself out of feeling the pain that you're feeling. So pain, of course, is understandable. Um, the problem happens when there's non-acceptance, the refusal to accept that um, this thing is painful or the pain that you're feeling or experiencing can often lead to suffering. And suffering can of course make the whole situation way harder to tolerate. And so the reason that radical acceptance is a distress tolerance skill is that it's there to help us to get to the point where we can at least try to reduce the suffering so that we're left with pain, um, which could actually be a little bit more tolerable and could be something that we could work on. Action is when you have this emotional experience, but the emotion doesn't fit the facts or the facts don't change the emotion. So you might know that the test isn't the end of the world and you still feel panicked, or maybe the emotion fits the facts, but its intensity or the amount of it or the length of it doesn't make sense, right? So um, you got cut off in traffic but now it doesn't make sense to be angry for the next hour of driving at every other driver on the road. Or maybe the emotion gets in the way of your goals. So maybe an adult goes to a performance review with their boss and the boss provides corrective feedback, <clears throat> which is invalidating and upsetting and hard to hear for all of us. Um, and let's say the person gets angry and hurt and sad. Um, and they have the urge to act on the sadness by crying and the hurt and the um, anger by attacking that's not going to be helpful in a job uh, performance review, right? So you've got to be able to dial that down in that situation. The, the emotion, we can understand why you have the emotion. It activated things that are important to you. And at the same time, acting on it is not going to be useful. It's going to make things worse for you. I'm in the grocery store. There's uh, uh, a person in front of me in line who has 16 items, and this is the 12 item line. Does it fit the facts to be angry about this? Mm, maybe. Let's talk about intensity. Mildly annoyed, okay. Furious, doesn't fit the facts, right? So if you're furious, if you're thinking this is absolutely in, improper, 16 items, 12 item lane, then you might go with a more intense reaction where the anger or some version of anger does fit the facts, right? Like, ah, uh, it's not cool that this person's taking advantage of the system and making me wait a little longer but acting up is just likely to cause trouble for you. The opposite is going all the way with the opposite emotion that you're feeling. So if you're feeling fear, just standing where you are is not opposite. Opposite is leaning in, right? The urge with fear is pulling back. Neutral is staying where you are. Opposite is leaning in, right? So opposite action is harder than neutral action and more powerful than neutral action. But people often get hung up on this because they think if I didn't act on my action urge, that's opposite action, right? No, 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 no. That's neutral action. And it might be effective, especially if you combine it with the thoughts and with the body sensation. But you want to go, if you really want to do opposite action like a pro, you want to go all in on the opposite of the emotion.